Glue Wednesday. You see, it's my belief that we don't have to get over. We need to find ways to keep it together. And my glue is G-L-U-E. God's love undoes everything because that's what keeps it together. That life is about going from one puzzle to the next. You're either a small, medium, or large piece of each puzzle in your family, social, or business relationships. Yet, yet, no matter what size puzzle piece you think you are, without you, the puzzle is labeled as incomplete. <laughs> you know, so often, so often people use the cliche hump day to describe their, what they believe is Wednesday's value to the week. Well, one, first of all, I think that hump has the connotation of the need to get over. And two, Wednesday is actually not the middle of everybody's work week. Even though it is the middle of the seven day stretch called the week, it's the day that keeps the new week and the weekend together. And so that's why I think that what we need to focus on is not the fact that we need to get over, but the fact that we need to keep it together. And that's why I call it Glue Wednesday. And my glue stand is G-L-U-E, God's love undoes everything. Not the fact that he will tear stuff apart, but whatever is torn apart, he will put it back together. And what better day to do it than on Wednesday? I'm Sporty King, and welcome to Glue Wednesday. My topic today is going to be self-control. Now, a lot of times when we hear self-control, uh, we instantly start to think about losing control. And we start thinking about anger. So I'm going to use a couple of acronyms with you and get that out of the way. But I'm going to really put the salve on this whole thing and make us feel good about the self-control by talking about winning and faith. But first, let's look at what anger can do for you. I had originally, when I wrote my book, Affirmations, and, and that's the acronym that are affirmations. You say them as often as you like, and they will make you feel good. And those of you who have used any of my things, you know that they do. So I, and like they said, you know who you are. Okay, so I first had anger as A-N-G-E-R. Avoidable nonsense geared toward energy reduction. Avoidable nonsense geared toward energy reduction. Then I thought about it and I realized, you know what? You really can't avoid anger. So I changed the definition. And that's the thing that we have to remember we can do. We can change, we have to grow. But the thing is, if you change your mind, don't be ashamed to say, that's the way I used to think. A lot of people want to say, no, no, I never said that before. You have to first admit the mistake you made or the belief you had, because it didn't really have to be a mistake. It could just have been what you believe based on the information that you had to make the decision. So stop getting caught up in allowing people to tell you that you were wrong. The key is that you had the right to make a choice, and the information that you had helped you make that choice and decision. So I went away from calling, <coughs> excuse me, anger avoidable nonsense geared toward energy reduction to applying negativity geared toward energy reduction. Applying negativity geared toward energy reduction. Because what happens with anger? It's a anger is a reactionary emotion. If I can keep you angry, I can control you. So I have to find a way to make you feel negative. I've got to do something negative to get you pissed off and upset. And in the process of doing that, what will you start to do? You, I'll be on your mind. I'll be renting space in your mind where you're constantly thinking about how you can get back at me. And I'm using me just to be nice, but you got somebody pissed off that just came on into your mind that you can that you thought about, and they've been controlling you because you've been angry at them. Let it go. Whatever they did was just part of the deal. Mm. And I'm not saying we walk around and we just, you know, free love like we used to back in the hippie days in the 60s, free love, and we just love and forgive everybody because my belief is that I forgive and forget, but the penalty still applies. <laughs> so the truth is, I will forgive someone but I just change where they are in my friendship circle. <clears throat> because your first five roles are important. The first five roles in your life, you have to really make sure that those people who are sitting in those roles are the people that you want to be up close. Because those are the ones that you can really see when you look down and you need to support. I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, I've been where you are. Ah, bulletin, no, you haven't. I've never been where you are. I've never been in your shoes. But guess what? I've sat in your row. And so that's why it's so important that we're real conscious of who we put in our first five roles because that's the biggest thing that we share are those five roles in our lives. And so then I came and decided to put one more touch to anger and that's to make it actually negating God's expectations and requirements. 
Hmm. Actually negating God's expectations and requirements. Because guess what? What's God's expectation? That you enjoy life and that you honor him. And you honor him by doing what? By honoring yourself. How do you honor yourself? By honoring those around you. So we've got to find ways to deal with, and I'm not going into it all now, but you got spousal abuse, you got bullying going on in school, you know, you've got a lot of things where people are not honoring the people around them. Don't be one of those people. Because the key is, like attracts like. And if you decide that you're going to, you're looking for good people, you know, you can't show me five good people that are looking for a negative person to join them. So if you find it yourself that you're surrounded by negative people, well, guess what? You've chosen to keep them there. You've got to learn how to put people on pause. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? So here's what happens. <clears throat> and you can connect it to that, to that thing we were talking about with someone. If you're angry, they can control you. So you've got this person who pisses you off, and they call. And you look at the phone. You go, oh, man. Oh, it's them again. Hey, how you doing? Why are you answering it? Okay. <laughs> Once you see that that's that person that takes your energy down, remember we talked about negative energy? Once you see that that's that person that's going to piss you off and make your mood nasty, don't answer it. Put them on pause. Let them go. Does, doesn't call ID come with voicemail? Mm -hmm. And so you let them go to voicemail. And what, because what you are now doing is, a, is denying them 24-7 access to your spirit. That's what's going to take you down. It's the people that you allow 24-7 access is going to make a difference. So when it's somebody that's calling you and it's negative, then you got to let them go to voicemail. Nine times out of ten, what are they going to do? Not leave a message. Because they figure, oh, well, once they see my call ID, they'll call me back because I got it like that. That's because they're controlling you. <laughs> Don't call them back. Second time they call, they go to voicemail again. They might leave a message. Most of them still won't leave a message. Or, or they might say, oh, they're just checking up on you. That's, that's not a call to action. <laughs> so you don't have to call them back. I mean, it's up to you. And, and you know, how you want to, I'm telling you how to move people out of your life. I know a lot of people tell you how to bring people into your life. But guess what? You can't bring them in if you don't move, move some out because you got to make space. Sometimes the people that you want to bring in can see who you've got waiting with you. And they say, nah, I don't really think I want to come in there. It's not, you know, you all right with me. But I see who you got in the background. You see all this chaos in the background here? Sometimes they don't want to come into that chaos. So they need to have a smooth background. And you need to have a smooth background working for you. So let's go from talking about, let's talk about self-control, going from that anger, because that's not what we want to do. We want to talk about how, the good self-control. So I'm going to use the words win and faith to tell you about it. But you've got to remember that it's so important that you've got to work hard to find ways to, content, to maintain control of your life, because that connects to your destiny. Anger is a controlling emotion, and you have to let that go. So one of the funniest lessons I've actually learned about control, before even self-control, one of the funniest lessons I learned about control was when I was in Chicago in 1989, <clears throat> I decided to coach community league basketball, and I had a seventh grade class. And I said to them, I said, you know what, I'm going to teach you guys a lesson. You're in the seventh grade, it's not going to be that important to you right now, but years down the line, this is going to really make a difference to you. So I'm going to help you with your development. So I named the team the Controllers. I told them because it's so important to have that self-control. I said, when we get in the huddle, we're not going to scream. We're going to get in the huddle, put our hands in, we're going to go, shh, control. And then we're going to get out there and play some ball. We lost all 13 games. <laughs> because you know what I also learned? <laughs> that kids need energy. <laughs> and that shh, control was just that. <laughs> So, so what I did was because, you know, we have to make sure that we go forward and we have to learn. My kids didn't know how to win. They started losing so bad that we got to the last game. And so what I did, I went and bought them some warm-up jackets. Because all we get in the league was a, a jersey and a pair of shorts. I went and made some warm-up jackets, put their number on it and put their name on it. And I broke it out to them at the, in the first game of the playoffs. Because everybody makes a playoff. It's like hockey, yeah. It was 16. We had, we were, well, obviously, we were the sixth seed at 0 and 12. But once they put their jerseys, their warm-up jackets on, and they out there warming up, they were feeling so good. And, and our colors were white, uh, were um, uh, gold and black. 
And so they were looking good because I had the white jackets with the gold and black piping on it and their names and their numbers. They were feeling good. And they got out there. They were winning at halftime. We had never been winning at halftime before. So they had no clue what to do in the second half. And the second half, that team beat the crap out of us. But the key is they felt good about it. So let me fast forward to the next year because I learned my coaching lesson. And that's what sometimes we don't do as parents, as an adults. We have to learn our coaching lesson. And so since I said I learned that kids need energy, I said, let me let them get that war cry. And so when I coach the eighth grade, because all the kids go back in the draft, I don't get the same kids. You know, you got to repick the kids. And this time I said, number one, I'm going to let them scream in the huddle. And number two, I let them name themselves. <laughs> And I tell you, it was so cool. They named themselves the Troops. This was back in 1990. And they named themselves the Troops in, in recognition of what our soldiers, our company, was, our country was going through in the Persian Gulf War. And I thought that was beautiful. So in the, in the regular season, we took fourth place. We did good. We took fourth place. And then through the playoffs, we beat the crap out of two teams in a row. We made it to the championship. And we're playing the number one team in the championship. They're beating us the whole game until there was like 12 seconds to go, you know, because we stayed in there. We came back, and it was 12 seconds to go. My guy stole the ball, and he was going down, and he missed the layup. The best kid in the league on the other team got the ball, and he came back down, down court, and he took a three-point shot from the key. And P.S., by the way, I skipped one point. We had, when I, before we got that steal, we had gone up. We were finally up two points. When he hit that three-pointer, bam, they went up one point. And then my guy, Rick, turned to me. He said, call a timeout, coach. I said, right. And you know what? They came in. And we sat down and we talked about what we were going to do. Because here's what the real lesson was. We, I already told you that we didn't win the championship. So what happened was we got our last shot. See, sometimes all that matters is that you get your last shot. My guys got a chance to call one more play. And not only did the play work, we got the shot, we missed it, and Court got the rebound, and before he could go back up, the clock went off. But the key is once we came back in the huddle, all of my kids felt good. Because number one, we had gotten our last shot. You have to remember, you can get the last shot in your life if you take your time and stay calm. And, and you should have seen the other team because they were nervous because they couldn't believe why, how we would not give up. We were the fourth seed. We weren't supposed to be that good. And they had been winning by double digits. And so uh, when we made that comeback, you could see the look on their face. And sometimes you have to look for that look on someone else's face. They can't believe that you're not giving up. People see you getting stomped on and things going against you, and you still getting up every morning and coming out and smiling. They can't believe it. So don't let it be a fake. I know people say fake it till you make it. Don't fake it till you make it. Be truthful and believe in yourself. Figure out what a personal win is. See, winning is personal. W-I-N, what I need. Each one of us has a personal win that makes us a champion of our surroundings. And that's what keeps going up, you know, in front of us. And that's what people have to be able to see, that you feel that you are a winner. In, in 1996, I competed at the Toastmasters International Speech Contest World Championship of Public Speaking. And I finished as one of the top nine speakers in the world. Now, what Toastmasters does, they announce three, two, one. And when they announce the third place winner, the second place winner, and the first place winner, they didn't say my name any of those three times. But when I came home and people said, Sporty, how'd you do in a contest? I said, I tied for fourth <laughs> with the other five that didn't take first, second, or third. <laughs> because you see, I never see myself as a loser. Losing is a state of mind where you decide that there are no other options. And you've, that means you've forgotten that you are the option. Because you've done the bravest thing you can do every day. Every day that you lay your head down and go to sleep, that's as brave as you could get. Because you have no guarantee that you're going to wake up. So if you've decided to be that brave, why not go the next step? I never lose. That's why my name is Sporty King. And it's so cool because people say, oh, that's a nice name. I say, you can't use it because it's mine. <laughs> And so you make sure that you are conscious of using your name and making it mean what it has to mean for you. And so that's where the faith comes in. After you know what your personal win is, now you've got to have the faith, F-A-I-T-H, feeling as if there's hope. <laughs> Recognizing that the only thing you cannot do is give up. Have you given up on yourself? 
Have you given up on your family? Have you given up on your friends? It's a long list. But the key is you cannot give up. And if you look at your track record, I say trust your track record and laugh at your lack record. Because if you look back, you'll find out that there were things that you thought you couldn't do and you still had man managed to do them. So get that personal win and have that faith. And here, go on and mouth this with me. Close, because you got to, I know I was on Doc Honeycutt's show earlier and we talked about the, what, the power in the words, the words that we speak. So that's why you got to be careful about the cliches we use. But finish this cliche for me and, and then you're going to see a good outcome, okay? You mouth it to the camera and I'm just going to give you a little poor spot, okay? <laughs> When one door oh, when one door closes, now you probably said another will open, and that's cool. But I got a new one for you. When one door closes, go for the windows. <laughs> go for the windows because there's usually more windows than there are doors. And what we have to constantly do is put ourselves in position to win. We make a lot of good choices, but we focus on the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And we focus on the ones that somebody else told us was bad. They, not, they weren't necessarily bad for us. They were decisions that we made based on the information that we had to make the decision. So when one door closes, go for the windows. But one time I'm talking to a, a group of um, airmen in the Air Force, and I said, you know, and I you know, finished that sentence. When one door closes, and one guy screamed out, it locks. <laughs> <laughs> And isn't that the truth? Sometimes, you know, life is a one-time deal. It's not dress rehearsal. This is the only life you get. Mm. And so if you don't have the faith to follow your dreams, to get your personal win, when your window of opportunity comes, because the window of opportunity is small, if you don't recognize your window, you won't go for it. And then if you don't go for it, you can't get it. So it can lock. It's a very, it's an instant of a thought. And that's what you want to do. So constantly find ways to feed your spirit. Like I said, I was on the Doc Honeycutt show. You'll see she's got this little journal. And it's a nutrition journal, you know, about eating healthy and stuff. I'm not going to try to eat healthy, because I say, you know what, you can't tell me I'm out of shape if I don't have a shape to show you. And then I always tell people that, you know, I'm glad I didn't have six-pack abs, because now that way when they look at my keg, they can't think that I'm overeating. They recognize that I just got my 240s and they're merging. So so the thing is, you have to find ways to keep yourself entertained, get your personal win, keep your faith going, put your glasses on so that you can read the end of the show. All right? So that's what you want to do is, let's recap. Number one, because of my belief in the importance of self-control, I taught my boys, and P.S., by the way, I call them boys. I didn't call them young men. They were boys. They were in the seventh grade and the eighth grade. They are still boys. And when we start, it's, and again, it's, it, it becomes that mental the things that we use. If you keep calling them men, then they start to try to do manly things too soon. You know, I'm not, yeah, they boys. Okay, so you know, so that's what you have to do. But hey, that's a whole nother topic. But I taught my boys that it was important to begin to control their emotions for future success and that this lesson would become clearer to them years after having me as their coach. The same for you. I learned and now believe that it's important to let kids energize themselves with a hearty war cry. None of this shh control. But they because they were saying troops and they got out there and then I had another team that we they say it's we say what time is it? They say showtime. That was when I had gotten to where I was coaching high school because then I coached high school for eight years. And and boy, we, we had some good teams. Now that first team I told you about my eighth grade team, we finished second and we lost that championship game by one. Years later in high school we went to, I went to the championship again and we lost by two. But that time we were the second seed and the first seed beat us. But, uh, you know, and I never won the championship. P.S., by the way, never won the championship. But everybody wanted to play on my team because I never focused on the winning the game as much as winning the spirit. One time I took my best player out because he didn't do what I said. And so one of the, 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 the commissioner, he said, well, why'd you take your best player out? Because he didn't do what I said. See, I'm, if I'm coaching and I'm teaching them the fundamentals and the basics, because if you're going to coach youth sports, you have to teach the fundamentals and the basics. And adults, we need to start focusing on the fundamentals and the basics, too. Are you reading aloud enough? See, we, sometimes we read and, and, and we speed read. And now, and now when there's a chance to read aloud, maybe you got an interview or something and you have to read aloud and you're fumbling and sound like you can't read and like you're illiterate. 
It's not that. It's just that we don't practice it enough. So every now and then, read aloud. And go on and have that flashback. Don't you say that to kids? Come on, read aloud. Sit and sit and say it to yourself because it's so important. Okay? The future is actually, by the way, in good hands. Think about it. When I let them name themselves, they were socially conscious. Yeah. And they named themselves the troops. So the future is in good hands. Stop beating up our kids. You know, they are, you know, the reason they're doing the shortcuts because they're long to them. We had it the long way and we created the shortcuts. So why do you think, you know, oh goodness, you got you got a remote and you got 3,000 stations. Did they come out of the womb looking for a remote with 3,000 stations? No, we created that because we had three stations. And so stop beating up the kids for stuff that we invented, all right? Get your personal win by strengthening your faith and calming your spirit. And you recognize that you can call a timeout. You can call a timeout and get one more shot. My kids knew that they could call that timeout and, and they could get that shot because they knew that they were worthy, that they were good, not lucky. They knew that they were worthy. So I'm going to close with a poem that I wrote in my book called I, I Found Out I'm Dying. And, it's, it, it, it's, and you know what? i got to tell you this. I Found Out I'm Dying, a celebration of life. Sometimes we get caught up in the headlines and we forget to read the we forget to read the subtitles. So this book is not at all about dying. It's about the fact that physically we're all going to die one day. Get over it. One day you won't be here. So find that out and do the things that you need to do to live a, a productive life. So this poem is called Sometimes I Wish I Were Lucky because I don't believe in luck. I believe in being good. And see, I know how good I am. And people say, well, sporty, you know, you're just self-centered and conceited. I say, no, I'm self-confident and convinced. I'm convinced how good I am, and I know how good you can be if you just think about it. Because guess what? You don't go anywhere and say, no, I can't do it. You go and say, yes, I can. So go on and let it, and the people who don't like you to be confident, people who don't want you because they decide to label you as arrogant, bye. You know, you know it's, it's not about them. It's about you. God gave you you. And so how well are you doing with this used property that you've got? You've got a, a, a rented vehicle in front of you. And so you want to make sure you use it, like they say, till the wheels fall off. So keep recognizing that you're good, that you're not lucky, because you've never been you know, lucky to be in a relationship. You've always been good enough to be loved. Never been lucky to have a job, always been good enough to be gainfully proactive. Never been lucky to pass a test, always been good enough to get an education. Never been lucky to make a team, always been good enough to be in the game. Never been lucky to wake up in the morning, always good enough to enjoy this gift of life. Never been lucky to hope that you, know, that you find God, but good enough to recognize that God has never lost track of who you are. So that's how we have to recognize that it's always about being good. But you see, sometimes I wish I were lucky instead of just so good. <laughs> if I could just be lucky, I might share my luck. No, in fact, I know I would. Now, some people say that I'm lucky. I correct them and remind them that I'm blessed. I'm spiritual, fortunate, in tune with myself. Nothing outweighs my thirst for happiness. You see, luck itself doesn't last. It provides a glimmer of hope or chance. Luck forces you to take risks. Being blessed allows you to take a stand. Luck can give you that on top of the world feeling, that instant fix of elation. Being fortunate keeps you on top of the world and allows you to enjoy the sensation. Spirituality is such a popular thing now, but it means much more than meets the eye. If you get lucky enough to get spiritual, hold on, don't let that spirit die. If you get lucky enough to find yourself, Enjoy the challenge of introspection. Realize its value toward your growth. Understand that you're supposed to have success. Your purpose is ordained. You must choose to lead a prosperous life. You must make sunshine out of rain. But I must admit, sometimes I wish I were lucky instead of just so good. But when I stand out from the rest, if you're lucky, you can be in good company. If you're blessed, you can be with the best. And so as I look at you as being the best, I remind you, number one, all of my retention materials, you'll find them at my website, sportyking.com. Each purchase comes with a personalized and free autograph. 
So you make sure that you get yours. But it's a wonderfully interactive site. You don't have to sign up to anything to enjoy my spirit because my spirit is just a part of what God has gifted me with, and I'm happy to be your gift. I'm so happy that you allow me to be an important piece of the puzzle because life is about going from one puzzle to the next. You're either a small, medium, or large piece of the puzzle in your family, social, and business relationships. Let, yet, no matter what size piece of the puzzle you see yourself as, without you, that puzzle is called incomplete. My name is Sporty King. Let's make sure that we do this again. Have a safe and savvy week, and I'll see you again on Glue Wednesday. And y'all remember that on Wednesday, regular Wednesday, pick up that broadcast from the Wake Up Call Network.